So remember yesterday, um, we talked about uniqueness, and we proved that the solution to the heat equation or diffusion equation, whatever you want to call it, is unique. So that the um, solution that we were finding by using the Fourier series was the solution. And then we talked about steady states of the system. Okay, so now I want to begin this lecture by, first of all, just a little note about the steady states, okay? Because remember, we've got dt by dt equals d2t by dx squared, okay? And then we said it's steady state, t is just t of xt is just now a function of x. And that means this derivative is 0, and this becomes an ordinary derivative. OK? And then yesterday, remember, we solved this um, for the Dirichlet problem. But remember, at the beginning of the lecture course, we talked about ordinary differential equations. And we showed examples where there were no solutions. We showed examples where the solution was non-unique. Okay? So there's a question here. In the problem we did yesterday, it was all fine. We were able to get a unique solution. And with Dirichlet boundary conditions, that's all fine. Because basically, Dirichlet boundary conditions say, so if you integrate this up twice, you get a line. And the Dirichlet boundary condition gives you two points. And so you can draw a line through any two points. And that line is unique. And therefore, you get the unique solution. OK? So it all works out fine. But what about if we had Neumann boundary conditions? And in particular, if they were homogeneous, what would happen then? So we integrate this up. We get t equals ax plus b, where a and b are constants that we need to find. A Neumann boundary condition means dt by dx at um, x equals 0. Say we're going from 0 to L is 0, dt by dx at x equals L is 0. And that implies all that does is tell us that A is 0. Right? And that's obvious. If you've got a straight line, and if its gradient is 0 at one point, its gradient has to be 0 everywhere. So we've got two boundary conditions, a second order ODE, and we've got a non-unique solution. There's arbitrary constant. OK? But so this might make you think, well, this is also a solution of the heat equation, right? I mean, this satisfies the heat equation. So this suggests that there may be a non-unique solution. But we're ignoring one other condition. That's the initial condition. We forgot the initial condition or the initial value. Remember, t at x 0 equals some f of x. <coughs> so the t equals b, that steady state has not taken into account that we actually started with a certain amount of stuff, OK? So if we started with a certain amount of stuff, and if we don't, don't allow the stuff to leave 
the boundary, then the total amount of the stuff must be the same, must be conserved. Okay? So we have conservation. And when we did this a while back, but let's just do it again. Conservation. So if we let um, total t of t equal the integral, you know, this is the, in, the, in the general framework where t is a function of, of, of little t, then we have that dt by dt. We can use Leibniz to write this. And the heat equation gives us this. We can integrate that up. Gives us this. So that's by the heat equation. That's by Leibniz. And that's zero by the homogeneous Neumann boundary conditions. So that implies t is a constant. And what is it initially? t is the integral from 0 to L. t of x, well, initially, t, little t is 0. So it's that. At steady state, t is integral from 0 to L b dx. which is BL. So if T doesn't change, it means B must be 1 over L and to go from naught to L f of x dx. So it is a unique solution. OK? So that's the thing to always keep in mind, that to get the arbitrary constants in your steady state, sometimes having conditions on t, like derivative t equals 0 or something like that, is not sufficient to get those conditions. And then you have to look for a conservation law. See, there's a conservation law at work to get the condition. Okay. So you see there's a subtlety there when we change from Dirichlet boundary conditions to Neumann boundary conditions. So now if we move on to Neumann boundary conditions, so we'll just call this other boundary conditions, but we'll focus on Neumann. <clears throat> and so typically what you say here is if the ends of the rod are thermally insulated, And that means there's no flow. That means minus kappa dt by dx, or say minus k, I should put, dt by dx is 0. The flux is 0 at the boundaries. And that implies dt by dx is 0 at x equals 0 L. And that's true for all time. OK, so now a couple of subtleties here. So now if we do the usual thing, look for a separable solution. And then we get f double dashed. Well, we should write down the, the equation we're solving.
Okay? Um, so then we have the usual thing. Equals, now I get the kappa in the right place. Um, kappa. Equals, I'll actually put it over to this side, 1 over kappa, um, g, oh, g dashed over g. Okay, and then the usual thing then, the usual argument we go, is we say, that's a function of x, function of t. They can only be equal to each other if each of them is a constant. And now the question is, what is that constant? So if that constant is positive, this will give hyperbolic sines and cosines. And boundary condition means that some of the hyperbolic sines and cosine has to be 0 at two points, which means that the solution is, const is constant and, in fact, is 0. So that's a 0 solution. So we discard that. And then if we look at this being 0, then in the Dirichlet case, we get 0 as a solution. But now in this case, we get constant. So if f double dashed over f of x equals 0, and then remember, the boundary conditions are that um, f dashed of x is 0 at x equals 0 L. So now, if we put that to be 0, whereas in the Dirichlet homogeneous case, we got f is equivalent to 0, here we get f is equivalent to a constant. Constant. And then if we have f double dashed over f of x equals some negative thing, then we get sines and cosines. And now the boundary conditions give us that the sine has to be 0. Because you, you differentiate sine, you get cosine. Cosine of 0 is 1. So to satisfy the boundary condition, that dx by dt is 0 at x equals 0 means you can't have any sine. So now you've got the cosines. Okay, so now we've got a cosine series. And remember, in the cosine Fourier series, there's already a constant in there, which is essentially cause of n pi x over l for n equals 0. So this constant here, we can incorporate into the Fourier cosine series, OK? So then we end up getting t of x, t equals half a naught plus the sum, n goes from 1 to infinity, a n cos n pi x over l times e to the minus n squared i squared kappa t all over l squared. Okay? And so that constant here is incorporated into here. And then how do we find the a naught and the a n's? As usual, we write down the initial value or initial condition is f of x, t is equal to little f of x. So I haven't written that down. So we need to go back up here. Let's have t at x equals naught to be little f of x. Then we're going to have f of x equals 1 over 2, a half a naught, plus the sum 
n goes from 1 to infinity, a n cos n pi x over L. And this is the, the Fourier cosine series of f. So now we do the usual thing that we make the periodic even extension of f to be on minus L, L. And then we write down the um, Fourier coefficients for little f. And so then we have um, that a naught equals 2 over L, integral from naught to L, f of x dx. And then a n equals 2 over L, integral from naught to L, f of x cos n pi x over L dx, for n equals 1, 2, 3, etc the usual thing, okay? And so now what happens as t goes to infinity? Well, as t goes to infinity, as little t goes to infinity, once again, all these terms here go to zero, which means then that t of x t tends to a half a naught, which is 1 over L integral from naught to L f of x dx. If we look at that term, that term, it doesn't depend on t. Okay, it doesn't depend on x either, but it doesn't depend on t, so it's a steady state. So this is steady state. And look, it's exactly the same as the steady state we found here. So it all makes sense. OK? So basically what this says is that if you start off with any sort of um, uh, initial t at x zero, what will happen is the diffusion will smooth it out. And so that will end up giving you t of x t as, t, as little t goes to infinity, you'll end up getting, well, we should draw that axis in here, draw that in here. You get something like this, where the area under here is the same as the area under here, because the total amount of stuff stays constant. OK? And then uniqueness of this solution follows as before. Remember, we did uniqueness. We saw that uniqueness also worked. We did it for the um, uh, homogeneous Dirichlet, but we saw it would work also for homogeneous Neumann. OK? So now the last thing we want to do is talk about um, briefly inhomogeneous um, heat equation. So what does that mean? Well, if you go back to the first two lectures when we had all these definitions, what do we mean by an inhomogeneous equation? We meant that if you put all the derivatives on one side, well, if you then had nothing on the other side, that was a homogeneous equation. But if you had something on the other side that wasn't zero, that was an inhomogeneous equation. 
So that would be something like this. We'll write it in this form. Okay, so in the, what we've been doing in the past is just taking that row C, putting it down here, and calling that kappa. But now we're going to have this, a Q. So you can see here, if we take all the derivatives onto one side, we've got non-zero on the other side. Right? So what is this thing from a physical point of view? So if we go back right to the beginning of this um, uh, section, chapter 3, remember we had the rod. And this was x. And then remember we took a little cross section x equals a and little cross section x equals a plus h. And then we asked the question, what's the rate of change of heat in here? And so the heat was t of xt, then multiply by rho dx to give the mass, multiply by a to give the area, multiply by CV to convert temperature to heat energy. So this is stuff that you had before. Equals amount of stuff in, where this is the flux, minus amount of stuff out. So that's what we had. And then we, um, we had this going from um, uh, A to A plus H. And then remember we did um, uh, Leibniz to get the D by DT into here. It becomes a partial D by DT. And then we divide it through by H. And then we used the fundamental theorem of calculus. And we ended up after so, so this is this you have in your notes already, Leibniz plus fundamental theorem of calculus. We ended up getting C V rho, and I, I've noticed actually that at times I've igno I've left this, the V out here, but maybe you should put that back in. Sorry about that. Um, d by dt equals minus d q by dx, and then we used Fourier's law to say q was minus k dt by dx. So remember, we did all that, OK? But this is the, on the assumption that heat is not produced or it's not lost. But suppose you were heating the thing as well, OK? I know that. In this day and age, that's a sort of strange concept of actually heating anything. But let's assume that we were very rich and could heat the thing. Then we would have plus integral from A to A plus H Q dx times A, where Q would be um, say, the um, uh, heat energy per unit volume. So total amount of heat would then be A times dx. Then you integrate from A to x. And now if you think about it, if you follow through, well, the first thing is the big A's will cancel. And then remember, we divided through by h to get this thing. Then if you, div and if you divide this by h, and then we took the limit as h goes to 0. By the fundamental theorem of calculus, that would just come down and be a q. So that's how we get that q in there. Okay. So remember, having got to here, we divide by h. Well, we divide by A, first of all, the big A. Then we divide by H, and we use the fundamental theorem of calculus. OK, so that's the source. 
if it's positive, could be a sink if it's negative. So that's how we would get this equation. And now the question is, how do we solve that equation? Well, let's put down some boundary conditions. Let's assume we've got homogeneous Neumann. So we've got dt by dx at 0, t equals 0 equals dt by dx at L, 0. So, of course, you can, you know, that's the same as writing it down as dt by dx equals 0 at x equals 0 at L. That's true for all t bigger than 0. And we've got some initial condition t of x, 0 equals f of x for 0 less than x less than L. So the only difference between this problem and the problem we've just done is that you've got the Q in there. Okay. Now we can prove uniqueness I leave that as an exercise for you to do. But if you think about it, suppose there were two solutions. So T1, T1, and T2, T2. Then remember what we did to prove uniqueness. We said, let W be the difference between the two solutions. Well, the difference between the two solutions will satisfy the homogeneous heat equation because the Q's will cancel each other out. The T1, T1, Q, T2, T2, Q, subtract T1 minus T2, T1 minus T2, Q minus Q, zero. So we're back to the problem we were looking at before. Dw by dt equals kappa d2w by dx squared, Zero flux boundary conditions on kappa on, on W, initial condition zero on W. Write down I is the integral of W times W. Di by dt will end up being negative or less than or equal to zero. So I is constant, it's zero. I mean I is a constant and therefore we've got our uniqueness. Okay, so proving uniqueness here is trivial. Now the question is, can we actually find the solution? That's, um, leave that as an exercise. Okay. So we can, if, we, if some way we can find a solution, then we've got the solution. Okay. So there's, there's many different ways in which we can think about this. So, well, suppose that Q wasn't there. Then the solution to this problem would be the Fourier cosine series, right? So consider T of xt equals now with the with the Fourier cosine series, this would be a constant. So it's not quite the Fourier cosine series. We're putting that as a function of t. And then we've got now notice here normally that would be a n e to the minus something times t. But now we're just calling it unt. Okay? So we, if you look at that t of x, t, that satisfies the boundary conditions. Okay? So that's why we took n pi x over L. And remember, what is unt? It's the 2 over L integral from naught to L. Ah, the Fourier coefficient. 
Okay. So if we could find un, then we could find t, right? We could find un for all n, then we could find t. Problem is, how, how can we find un? un depends on t. So how can we find un to find t if un depends on t? Well, it's a pity, because otherwise this was a really good idea. Well, let's put un into that equation up there. Or another way, let's put, let's look at rho c dun by dt. What would that be? That would be two over L integral from naught to L rho c dt by dt times cos n pi x over L dx. By Leibniz. Okay, so make sure I've got the constants right. So this is 2 over L, integral from naught to L, multiplied by rho c, rho c, take the derivative inside, and we get that. That is by the heat equation k d2t by dx squared cos n pi x over L plus q cos n pi x over L dx. So if we've done that right, we've said rho c, well again I've forgotten to put the v in here, not that it makes that much difference really. Um, rho c v, the big t by the little t is k d2t by dx squared plus q. And then we multiply by the cos. Okay? So what does that equal? I leave you to show that that first term, this term here, ends up giving you a, um, sorry, maybe do it out separately. I leave you to show that that's minus n squared pi squared over l squared un. How are you going to do that? Uh, no, we're just looking at, at this thing. Okay. Um, so we're going to say that t, t is that thing. Okay, so you differentiate t twice with respect to x. The u naught disappears, and we get cosine multiplied by minus n squared pi squared over l squared. Okay, so then we've got an infinite sum here. with the un and cosine, call it m pi x over l, sum from m going from 1 to infinity. And now we use orthogonality. So when you multiply a whole pile of cosines by cos n pi x over l and integrate, the only thing you get is the cosine 
n pi x over l squared integral. Okay? So that gives you that by orthogonality, by substituting t of x, the, the Fourier cosine series of t of x, and using orthogonality. Okay, so that means what we end up having is rho c du n by dt equal or plus k n squared. So this is where the kappa comes in now. Divide through by that. Equals of the un. This term here. But what is 2 over L, the integral of Q times cos n pi x over L? It's the nth val value of the um, cosine Fourier series of Q. where qn is 2 over l, integral from naught to l, q t qxt cos n pi x over l dx. Okay. In other words, the Fourier cosine of q n t, of q t, okay? So this is how it's done in the lecture notes. Another way to think about doing this would be essentially what we've done here. We could just say we're going to, or what we could just say is, Let's expand T in its um, Fourier cosine. Let's expand Q in its Fourier cosine. Oh, Qn. And now let's substitute that in. Okay? Where Qn and the Q0 as well is 2 over L integral from naught to L. Q of xt calls n pi x over L dx. And let's substitute that in to the... Um, to the heat equation, substitute into the heat equation, and equate um, terms cos n pi x over L. Okay, so in other words, if you were to just take that, substitute into that, what you would end up getting would be huge sum of cosine. I mean, if you substituted all that in, took everything to one side, you'd get a big sum equals zero, summing over n. And if you wanted to, you could put that from zero to L as a way of getting the constant in. OK, so just think about it. Put that into that. It's all in terms of cosines. And then by orthogonality, 
this has to be 0 for each n. OK? And the reason, the way you get that is, if I want to pick out cos pi x over L, all I'll do is I'll multiply this by cos pi x over L, and then integrate. And the only thing I'll get left here will be the ones that have n equals 1 here. And if I want to get cos 2 pi x over L, I will just multiply this by cos 2 pi x over L, and then I will integrate again. Okay? And if I do that, I'll end up getting, getting this. Right? And this is the equivalent that you do in linear algebra. If, if in linear algebra, if you have ai plus bj equals 2i plus 3j, you say immediately a is 2 and b is 3. Okay? What you're really doing there is you're saying a minus 2 times i plus b minus 3 times j equals 0. And now you're saying multiply by i. And now use the orthogonality condition, which means that is 0, so a is 2. And then how are you going to find b? Write down this dot product with j. And then use the orthogonality condition to say i dot j is 0, j dot j is 1, 0 dot j is 0, so b must be 3. OK? So this idea that when you expand something in terms of an orthogonal basis functions, then you equate the coefficients of each individual function. So here you equate the coefficients of i, and then you equate the coefficients of j. And here what we're, what we're essentially doing is we're plugging in the Fourier expansion, cosine expansion, because of the zero flux boundary conditions. We're essentially writing everything as a Fourier cosine expansion. And then we are, cha we are keeping, equating the coefficients. That's what we're doing. Okay. And this is a very long-winded way of showing you that that's what you're doing, and that it's correct. Just like, I'm pretty sure none of you, given that equation there, would do this, and then say a must be two, b must be three. You'll just say immediately, A is 2, B is 3. But to prove it, you have to do this. And that's what we've done here. OK? So now we've taken this one PDE that we couldn't solve, and we've reduced it into an infinite number of ODEs. That's pretty good. So we've introduced it into an infinite number of ODEs, which are linear. And for an ODE, we need initial condition. And the initial condition, or the initial value, is un of naught. Well, it's the Fourier coefficient of the initial condition. Okay, and then we just, but now, of course, if this was a very simple thing, we could integrate this up, but if this is a horrible thing, if it depends on time, then typically we can't integrate it. So we have to do it numerically, okay? So like I say, if this was a very simple thing like a constant, we could get analytic solution 
and write down our analytic solutions. But if this is typically would be some function of t, then we can't integrate this. Well, we can integrate it and get un as an integral, but to evaluate that, we need to use numerical methods. And you'll be doing numerical sort of computational methods in, in various other courses to find that out. Okay. So there are some questions on this, but the important thing is, I mean, when you first look at this, it does look quite complicated. But if you look back on it, all we've done is we've expanded everything as a Fourier in their Fourier cosines. And then we've equated the Fourier cosine terms to get this thing here. Okay. So the last thing I want to mention, so just one thing that we haven't mentioned in the lectures, but it's in the problem sheet. And that is on um, problem sheet four. It, it suddenly produces this very strange thing. It shows this, it asks you to show that this is a solution of the heat equation when you're on an infinite domain. Okay, so the one thing we haven't done in the lectures is what happens if you're on an infinite domain? So we've kept to being on a finite domain. Okay? Now if you think about it, if you're on an infinite domain, then using the Fourier C is going to be a bit of an issue. Because remember, when we were in a finite domain, we could periodically extend the solution so that it's a Fourier series. So we could use Fourier series. If you're on an infinite domain, then you can't periodically extend the solution. Okay? And it turns out that this is the solution to the problem. So in the problem sheet, you're just asked to show that this is a solution. So you just asked, differentiate this respect to little t, get something. Differentiate it twice with respect to x, get something. And hopefully, those two somethings are equal to each other, with a kappa somewhere, hopefully in the right place. Okay. So we will, it's beyond this course to say, well, how did somebody come up with this? And this is something that's called a similarity solution. And this is something that if you do further problems in applied mathematics, you will do similarity solutions. Okay? But for the, for the, for the object of, of this course, just say, write this down by magic, and oh, look, it satisfies the diffusion equation. Okay? So you should now be in a position to do um, right up to and including problem sheet 5. And the last part of problem sheet 5, last question, asks you to do um, this similar problem here, except that in that problem you're giving boundary conditions that are Dirichlet. And so because you're given Dreesley boundary conditions, you will look for a solution of the form sine. Okay? But in fact, those Dreesley boundary conditions are, um, are not homogeneous. And so you're, you're, given, you're given the little hint for what you need to do. Okay? So with that, what we will do then is we will um, 
wave goodbye to the heat equation and we will give a warm welcome next time to the wave equation. See what I did there? I do have a lot worse jokes than that, by the way, but I'll save you from those. Okay, so basically this is the end of the Fourier stuff. And what we'll do next time is we'll go on to the wave equation, d2, um, y by dt squared is c squared d2y by dx squared. So we've already looked at this equation, but what we will do with this equation here is we will first of all derive it, and we will show that this is the equation that describes vibrations on a string. Okay, and then we will solve this equation. And to solve this equation, we will use something completely different. What we'll do is we'll write it as a separable solution, f times f of x times g of t. We will then show that f double dashed over f is a constant, g double dashed over g is a constant. We will then have some boundary conditions that means that f is sines and cosines, and then we will solve it on from there. Okay? Completely different to what we've been doing for the last four weeks, okay? Um, but, I mean, I joke, the only small difference is that whereas up here, the equation for the T component was a first order derivative, the T component here will have a second order derivative. And so that means instead of getting an e to the minus n squared pi squared over l squared, we will get cosines and sines. So our f will be cosines and sines, and our g will be cosines and sines. So that will be the only difference. Okay? But we'll sort of follow through a very similar methodology to what we've been doing for the heat equation, except that because of that difference, there will be subtle differences as we move through. So we'll do that next time. Okay.